Rebuilding a Stuart 5A steam engine, part 3. Testing the crankshaft bearings and fitting new bearing drip feed oilers. I'm having a bit of a break from cleaning up this engine because it's driving me nuts. As you may have noticed in the last episode, I've been scrubbing away at this paint with scouring pads, sandpaper and even using the edge of my steel ruler to remove paint from where it's not supposed to be, as well as keying the paint ready for a new coat of paint. Before I completely go mad and have to be taken away by men in white coats, I thought what I would do is quickly test the crankshaft. I now know that the crankshaft is accurate, I put it in the lathe and used the dial test indicator, I showed that in the last episode. Now it's time to put it in the engine and see what it feels like. And you will have noticed that I lubricated the bearings before doing this. Now this is very encouraging, the crankshaft spins just sat in the two lower bearings. No binding, no tendency to jump out, absolutely no tendency whatsoever to fly around the room. I would expect nothing less really because the crankshaft, like every other part of this engine, is very well machined. I have the components, it's just a case of fitting all these components together sympathetically so that they work in harmony with each other and not against each other. One of the first things I have to do is find out which bearing goes at which side and which is the front of the engine. The front of the engine, of course, crankshaft-wise, is the part with the eccentrics on it. It's a simple job to find out which bearing goes where. They only fit one way round. What I'm doing at the moment is just drawing some arrows with a felt-tip pen. I didn't like the look of that one. I'll put it in the same place as the other side. When you make videos like this, you cannot be too careful. I don't want to risk anyone writing me a letter and generally complaining about things, so the arrows are approximately in the correct place. And at the moment, I'm replacing the studs, and also I'm finding studs that are the same length. But I'm not too impressed with the studding on this engine. They're all different. Some of them are just pieces of threaded rod, some of them are proper studs, some are longer than others, and some are shorter. And if you look at the small oilers sticking out of the top cap, that's not even the right thread to screw into the top cap. I'm going to look at that very shortly. What I do notice is, as I'm tightening up these nuts onto the top cap, at one side, the nut is fouling the curved part of the top cap itself. So I removed the top cap, removed some metal, and refitted it. And even though this oil has fallen off, both of the nuts are completely flat on the top cap and the cap in turn is held squarely to the bed plate. But because the bearing is actually stuck to the top cap now, I'm going to have to persuade the top cap to sit level on the actual bearing brass. And I do this with a little piece of brass. You see what I mean? It comes back. And now when I tighten up the nuts, the gap is equal at both sides. This is a far better mechanical arrangement than it was. Everything sits very square, the nuts are bottoming onto the flat part of the metal on the top cap itself, so that's one side done. Now it's time to work on the other side. But before I do that, I think I'll treat the engine to something that's going to make it look a lot better. These are glass drip feed lubricators, and I think they look a lot better than the other ones which didn't fit anyway. These glass and brass drip feed oilers are available from a company called 21st Century Steam who generally sell on eBay. Once again, I'm not happy with the studs, so before I put on the newly repaired top cap, I'm at least going to make sure that the studs are correct. And as can be seen in this clip, I'm using a pair of lock nuts together to allow me to screw in the stud, and obviously to remove it because initially it wasn't the right length. I'm not going to show the fitting of the top cap to the other side. Suffice to say, it's fitted and the process was identical to the other side. So now I'm temporarily refitting the key in the flywheel keyway. This key is a little bit slack as I mentioned in one of the other episodes, but I will sort that out when I come to finally put the engine back together. I'm temporarily removing the oilers so I can put some oil down the hole. I don't want to fill the oilers because every time I take them out, the oil is going to go everywhere. So this is just to make sure that there's adequate lubrication on the crankshaft. Because at the moment the crankshaft is in very good order, it's not worn, it's not damaged, 
and as far as I can tell, I don't think this engine's run at all. I've mentioned this before in quite a few of my videos, but when you're rebuilding a steam engine, it is essential, and I mean essential, double underlined, to get the crankshaft right first. If you do not get the crankshaft right, if you don't get the alignment correct, and if it's binding, the engine will never run well. You cannot rely on brute force running it in. All it will do is prematurely wear the bearings. As you can see from the video, by spinning the flywheel by hand, it rotates very freely. And this is what I need to achieve. As I build up the engine, I need to constantly make sure that nothing stiffens up. I'll try and rephrase that. I need to constantly make sure that nothing binds. Everything must run in harmony with itself. I'm very pleased with the way this engine's going so far. It's starting to look and feel a lot better. And when I fit a rubber wheel in my electric drill, with very little pressure, the flywheel spins. If there was something wrong, then the rubber wheel would just skid round the flywheel. Well, that's it for now. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.